Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I'm a little loud. I'm a little loud, Bill. Can you turn me? Okay, good. You got it. Good. I sorry, I didn't see you moving. I sorry, I didn't see you moving. Sorry. There you go. Okay. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Brian Kiley, and I'm the minister here. Uh, and uh, I hope that you're going to feel welcome here. Uh, you may notice as they depart that some of our youth and their leaders part that some of our youth and their leaders are attired somewhat unusually, although it's often hard to tell from one week to the next. Um, but just to explain it, in case you're curious, they have arranged uh, an afternoon outing to the Comic Con that's happening, so, and they're partly in costume, except again for some of the leaders. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you see yourself in the world, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we meet on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 territory. It is a historic territory. It is a historic gathering place of many peoples and many cultures. If you are new here today, we invite you to stay afterwards for coffee hour and to get to know us. And if you haven't already done so, please visit the membership table uh, just across the hall and you'll find information and nice people. And you'll find information and nice people, I hope. We recognize that everyone here has a role to play to help us build this community. And we can do so by cherishing old friendships and by opening our circle to include newcomers. So we give thanks to those who work on behalf of this community every day. And we ask the staff in making services and everything else around here happen. Finally, I want to ask you to make sure your electronic devices are silenced. Uh, for those of you who are hearing impaired or have hearing challenged, our usher has uh, hearing devices. If you'd like, they're very, very simple to use, so just let them. Uh, it, as I said, it's our practice to join for coffee afterwards. We hope that you find something here that will move you or touch you or make you think or make you laugh. We'll take pretty much whatever I can get. Our service today focuses uh, on an unlikely today focuses uh, on an unlikely it's an apparently unlikely pairing of political discourse and Taoist philosophy, and so all the music selections today come from the Taoist tradition. So let us begin our service with a prelude. <laughs> The opening words are by one of the Taoist sages, Mo Tsi. When all the people of the world love, then the strong will not overpower the weak. The many will not oppress the few. 
The wealthy will not mock the poor. The honored will not disdain the humble. The cunning will not deceive the simple. I'd like to invite Jennifer Hinchcliffe up to light our chalice this morning. Jennifer is our erstwhile Jennifer is our erstwhile volunteer finder for Sunday morning tasks, fun tasks, as she says. Thank you. Would you please join in a responsive reading number 602? You'll find it at the back of your hymn book, 602. And if you would read the italicized, and if you would read the italicized portions. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace. If there is to be peace in the nations, if there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Our chalice sung response today is number 362, Rise Up, O, six, two, rise up, o Flame. 362. You can stay seated for this. Three times, please. Three times, please. like to invite our young people and their leaders to come forward to kindle our their chalices this morning. And the sung response will be the verse of number 118, This Little Light of Mine. Gordon, if you please. <laughs> Each week we take an offering to support the work of this congregation and because we are a self-sufficient, self-subsisting organization. But we also share uh, our gifts with the wider community. And for the month of September, we have been collecting for Camp Firefly. And for Camp Firefly. Camp Firefly is an organization that provides uh, a summer camp, safe summer camp activities for LGBTQ questioning youth uh, transgender kids, all of those things. Um, wonderful organization that has we've supported for years and does so much. Make an offering and listen to some more music. Thank you.
As we receive the offering, would you please sing the response printed in your order of service? Thank you for your generosity. So our next hymn is number 119. We are in election season, so once to every soul and nation comes the moment to decide. Sounds like a a pretty good hymn for today. 119. strong sentiment in that hymn and a real certainty about where truth and falsehood abide. So it's important perhaps to note that that was written as an anti-slavery hymn just around the start of the American Civil War when the lines were drawn. How we negotiate that is really what I want to talk about today. Chapter 76 of the Tao Te Ching A person is born gentle and weak. At death, the person is hard and stiff. Green plants are weak. At death, the person is hard and stiff. Green plants are tender with sap, but at their death, they are withered and dry. Therefore, the stiff and unbending is the disciple of death. The gentle and unyielding the disciple of life. Thus an army without flexibility never wins a battle. A tree that is unbending is easily broken. The hard and strong will fall. The soft and weak will overcome. The text of Taoism, it is a short book of philosophy. It contains just 81 passages like the one above, a mere 14,000 words. You can easily read it in one sitting, which makes it my very favorite world scripture. (laughs) World scripture. (laughs) Says one translator, the Tao Te Ching, the esoteric but infinitely practical book, has been translated more frequently than any work other than the Bible. The philosophy of Lao Tzu is simple. Accept what is in front of you, what is in front of you, without wanting the situation other than it is. Study the natural order of things and work with it rather than against it. For to try and change what is only sets up resistance. If we watch carefully, we will watch carefully, we will see that the work proceeds more quickly and easily if we stop trying if we stop putting in so much extra effort 
if we stop looking for results. End of quote. Now, this does not mean bowing down in sheep-like in sheep -like acceptance. Many of the passages of the Tao Te Ching talk about change and even warfare. If change is what you desire, look for the naturally occurring opportunities and work with them. Look for the right conditions. Or maybe contemplate a different way of solving the problem than the one that first springs to mind. Angry fists. Storming the battlements is seldom a successful tactic. But perhaps diverting the course of a stream so that it weakens the foundation and causes the rigid battlement to collapse under its right result will be achieved. Or maybe there's a path of negotiation available. Successfully undertaken, those discussions might simply render the battlements obsolete and unnecessary. If not today, then perhaps tomorrow. Those discussions might simply render the battlements obsolete and unnecessary. If not today, then perhaps tomorrow. There are only a few themes within the Tao Te Ching. One is that the Tao is a universal energy that is everywhere at once, inside of creation, and it's always accessible to us. But a second, and one perhaps more pertinent to this discourse, would be captured in the opening passage. Therefore, the stiff and unbending is the disciple of death. The gentle and yielding is the hardness, certainty, authoritarianism, the definite. These steal life and energy from the world, no matter how passionate those beliefs may be held. As something becomes fixed and frozen, frozen, it begins to die. Even if it's a beautiful thing, when it becomes fixed and frozen, it begins to die. Whether it's governing rules or military strategy, the human heart or an extreme political stance, once it's fixed and closed, it becomes, closed, it becomes brittle and can more easily be broken. Flexibility, openness, a willingness even to yield when needed, and a trust that things will succeed over time. Those are the ways of life. Life. Changing circumstances are better faced with flexibility, adaptation, and appreciation of the way things naturally are. The living are better served by creative solutions by compromise, by fresh approaches. approaches. The flexible person is seldom trapped and can often make use of the obstinacy of the hard and fixed to topple them. Now, the myth is that the Tao Te Ching was written by a minor court records king in the 6th century BCE. And supposedly he was a contemporary of Confucius, who was a very high court figure who held a great deal of sway over the philosophy of the nation. The Confucianism was typified by rigid and courtly manners and strict adherence to tradition. And the Tao Te Ching stands in sharp contrast. Now there is some doubt that Lao Tzu ever lived. The name simply means old master. We know nothing more. Some scholars think it's just a collection of Taoist writings. I'm not sure it actually matters. I'm not sure it actually matters. We have the text, and we should care more about the wisdom that it imparts than how it came to be. The Tao Te Ching would influence a religion, Taoism, and as with other scriptures or great works of philosophy, also what flow. Also, what flowed from it were all the various variations and institutions that would follow. Most of us will at least be passing familiar with two aspects of Taoism. First, and I'm sorry if you have to crane your necks to see it, but first is the uh, symbol of yin and yang. Yin and yang. The circle 
where light and dark are perpetually flowing into one another. You notice it's a curved line between the two, not a straight line. It's because they're always in movement. They are always flowing. There is no static place. Light and dark, energy retreat, male and female energies are always flowing into each other in complementary fashion. And you'll also note the similar black and white circles contained with each of the images. <clears throat> it's a reminder that some part of the opposing force is always present. We carry the whole world in us, the light, the dark, the positive, the negative, the attacking, the yielding. All of this is in us at all times. <clears throat> the second iteration of Taoism that might be familiar is the physical meditative exercise practice of Tai Chi. The second iteration of Taoism that might be familiar is the physical meditative exercise practice of Tai Chi. It is a form of gentle, repetitive movement based on Chinese martial arts. But it's done much more slowly into the other, balancing the aggressive thrusting movement with the yielding and retreating one. It is a beautiful visual poetry. Now the key is that the Tai Chi routine begins and ends in the same position, an equal balance of thrust and retreat actions. The feet are grounded about shoulder width apart, the knees are bent slightly, the pelvis is turned in, and the energy of Qi is held before you. I once worked for several years with a Tai Chi instructor who, when he was in that position, I would, have to use an, I would have to use an immense amount of force to knock him off balance. He was so completely grounded. And through all the movements of routine, the key of foot placement means that the person remains balanced and grounded no matter what position they are in, even position they are in, even when attacking and retreating, they are always in balance, always contained. We are grounded when we can face adversity with calm. We are grounded when we can face emotional disruption without disruption, without panic. When we are grounded, we can act from a position of strength without ever overextending. When we are grounded, we can see opportunity and move towards it. And when we are grounded, we can see danger and know when to danger and know when to yield. When we are grounded, we are keenly aware of the flow of contrasting energies symbolized in the yin and yang. When we are grounded, we embody both at once. Now, a startling nor a new revelation, especially if you've been listening to me for the last couple of years, but I think it bears repeating. We do not live in a society that places much value in balance and groundedness. I've observed many times in the past that we live in a culture where the word outward, push ahead, get more. Growth is our watchword. And we're not patient about it either. We want what we want and we want it now. It's not a culture that embraces retreat, yielding, or letting go, letting go, or even really patience. Though many of us have learned how to do all those things in order to preserve our own sanity. The early quote notes, if we watch carefully, we will see that work proceeds more quickly and easily if we stop trying, if we stop putting in, if we stop putting in so much extra effort, if we stop looking for results. To borrow from the Buddhist imagery, it's about not pushing the river, realizing the river will flow the way it wishes to flow. Goals are are great things. Ideals are, ideals are wonderful things. But devotion to goals and ideals at the exclusion of everything else drives us out of balance, makes us less supple and responsive. We become stiff and dry. I fear that the world, I fear 
that the world has moved sharply along the path towards hard and brittle. We see this in a pattern of conflicts around the globe, and we see it in the polarization of politics and social change movements here at home. On left and right, we hear extreme, we hear extreme voices permanently angry at the other side. Or as Christopher Waddell, a Carlton journalism professor, calls it, the perma-mad. Waddell writes that the, refer- that the early reform, the, sorry, that the perma-mad lacks, perspe- perma-mad lacks perspective. He says, not everything is a ten-alarm fire, and when everything is, then very quickly, nothing is. And he points out that the perma-mad were introduced into Canadian politics with the election of the first iteration of the Reform Party, where there were party, where there were a whole lot of perma-mad people who got elected, particularly from the West, who enjoyed, as he said, going, getting up in the morning, being mad, eating lunch, and being mad, and going to sleep, being mad. And he also noted how Preston Manning and the Reform Party quickly and quietly pushed them to the way of death. Now, maybe this is just the older man lamenting that things aren't the way they were, but I am these days most concerned with the loss of the middle ground of politics and social change. These worlds have become hard and brittle. I was originally wrote about the polarization of political debate, but I realized that debate is not the right word. It's given away to yelling matches, to social media disinformation, to the battle of the memes. Meaningful debate, meaningful discussion, at least in election season, appears season, appears to be dead. It's lost whatever suppleness it may have. Our Canadian election campaign, like the unending election cycle in the United States, is marked more than ever by the stiff and unending qualities that define Disciple of death. Disciple of death. I find this polarization has crept out of the political realm and into all aspects of our culture. People now complain and protest against microaggressions in ways that shut down discussion and debate. Debate. It seems that every time someone is offended, the conversation must stop and we have to deal with the offended person. Well, Okay, part of that is good, but sometimes the conversation needs to continue. It seems that every statement that's spoken aloud or written down is examined down, is examined not for intent and not for context, but for whether or not some line has been crossed. And it seems that public statements are no longer really heard. They are instead taken and weaponized curled back at the speaker with a heart entrenched on the right as it is on the left. It's entrenched in our conversations, whether they're political, concerns about indigenous issues, immigration questions, religious displays, racial concerns, gender and sexual relations, or climate change, all of which are really important issues. None of which are really important issues. None of which will be resolved by stiff and unyielding, yelling at the other side. I'm not suggesting a dismissive return to the good old or bad old days of suck it up whenever an insult or tasteless joke of some kind, or some kind suck it up whenever an insult or tasteless joke of some kind or some kind of harassment takes place. Nor am I suggesting that we ignore these issues of real concern. They are issues of real concern. There were many actions back then that were simply wrong and there are injustices to be addressed and social talk about such things agree that we can deal with those issues without resorting to labeling or name calling or starting fires. But our culture has moved to this place where hostility and entrenchment reign, where we've lost balance and we have lost our ground and we have lost our groundedness. Too many of us are choosing to live in rigid certainty, forgetting that rigidity and hardness is the way of death. Absolute stands may do our dreams and desires more harm than good. 
At our, prepare, at our peril, we forget that the, white and the black, that the white and the black of yin and yang are perpetually flowing into one another. Nature wants balance. And I suspect culture does too. Extremism never lasts, no matter how hard the masters might try to enforce discipline and doctrinal rigidity. But, but while extremism reigns, it is up to each one of us to find that place of balance, to find that place of groundedness, to not be knocked off our positions because one side or the other side is yelling at us. We have to stay and find our center. Suppleness and flexibility are finally far more likely to bring us what we most desire. If we work from that place of groundedness and see real and natural opportunities when and where they arise, then I think we have a greater opportunity to realize our dreams. Under heaven, nothing is more soft and yielding than water. Yet for attacking the solid and strong, nothing is better. It has no equal. The weak can overcome the strong. The supple can overcome the, can overcome the stiff. Under heaven, everyone knows this, yet no one puts it into practice. Therefore, the sage says, they who take upon themselves the humiliation of the people are fit to rule. They who take upon themselves the, upon themselves the country's disasters deserve to rule the universe. The truth often sounds paradoxical. Amen. We'll have a spirit of time of meditation. First, we'll begin by singing number by singing number one twenty three, Spirit of Life. Please remain seated. These words by Lao Tzu. Those who would take over the earth and shape it to their will never, I notice, su- I notice, succeed. The earth is like a vessel so sacred that at a mere approach of the profane, it is marred. And when they reach out their fingers, it is gone. For a time in the world, some force themselves ahead and some great noise and some are held silent. For a time in the world, some are puffed fat and some are kept hungry. For a time in the world, some push aboard and some are tipped out. At no time in the world will one who is sane overreach together.
Our closing hymn this morning is number 100, Peace Like a River, 100. Our chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls of each one of you. So carry it with you and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially we meet again. And then uh, we have a few announcements.